Good morning. Good evening, everybody. Thanks for joining us. We're just getting started and welcoming people to our webinar room. Hi, Nora. Hi, Jan. Nice to see you guys Hello. again. Hi. Hi, Annie. Hi, Juan. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. <clears throat> Hi, Wander. Hi, Megan. We have a great presentation for you guys today. Hi, Tatiana. Sumaya, thank you for joining us. Hi, Elizabeth. We will be using the chat box today for question and answers. And we'll also be using a new tool called Padlet where you can actually put in your question and other people can upvote uh, to show support so that we can ask uh, the right questions that get at your most, um, most pressing topics. We will give it just one more minute. I would appreciate it if everyone can put yourselves on mute. I think we will be, during the presentation, we will mute everyone except our speakers um, and use the question and answer box for your questions. So thanks everybody for joining. I see a lot of, a lot more participants can continue to come in. We'll get started in just a minute. Thank you, Wanda. We will be sure to send around the recording so that you won't have to miss the second half of the webinar. It would be great if people would like to introduce themselves in the chat box and just say where you're joining us from. I think we have a great, um, from the looks of it, a great group of people from all over the world. So please do say hello in the chat box. Singapore, thanks for joining us, Sophia. Hi, Roy. Hi, Daphne. Elizabeth is in Vermont. Wow, Brussels, Belgium, welcome. Hi, Eula. Well, because we have such a great presentation today, uh, as you go ahead and introduce yourselves, thank you for doing that in the chat box. I'm going to go ahead and uh, get started. Um, really, we've been looking forward to this presentation for a long time and to be able to share with you some of the midline results from BJAC Songbird Demand Reduction Strategy and Behavior Change Communication Campaign in Indonesia. So if we can go to the next slide, please. We're offering this webinar as part of USAID's Combating Wildlife Trafficking uh, Learning Agenda, where we really focus on three common strategic approaches to combating wildlife trafficking. Um, the the presentation today will really focus on the first one, which is that top box. And this is just a high level theory that if you change people's behaviors, then that will also um, lead to reduced wildlife trafficking and ultimately reduce wildlife crime. So if you can go to the next slide, please. So we have a set of learning questions that kind of guide our, guide our work in this learning program with the overall guiding question of what does effective demand reduction look like? And I just invite you, as you listen to this presentation today, think about how you would answer these questions regarding, uh, particularly the second and third bullet here, about how do you measure demand reduction activities and, and monitor them, and also think a little bit about the messaging strategies and how the BJAC team approached their work uh, with songbird traders and others in Indonesia. So next slide, please. Welcome, Nathan. So it is my pleasure to introduce Andrea Pavlik from USAID Indonesia. Andrea is a Foreign Service Officer and an Environmental Scientist currently working in Jakarta at USAID Indonesia. And she is the Project Manager or the 
Contractors Officers Representative for BJAC, which is a $19.5 million national level policy project working in forestry and biodiversity conservation. She's also USAID Indonesia's point of contact for counter wildlife trafficking, and she is going to introduce our, our two speakers today. So over to you, Andrea. Thank you, Megan. So Indonesia is a country of 266 million people living in an archipelago of over 17,000 tropical islands. These islands are home to incredibly diverse terrestrial and marine ecosystems with high levels of endemism. In fact, Indonesia has more endemic bird species than any other country on earth. This research resource rich archipelago nation with high population densities in some areas and remote communities in others also presents unique challenges across all development sectors. USAID partners with the government of Indonesia to improve maternal and newborn health outcomes, strengthen civil society, support workforce development, and strengthen natural resource management. Unsustainable natural resource use in Indonesia has supported short-term economic growth. It has also resulted in deforestation, land use change, and environmental degradation. The Environment Office's annual budget of around $40 million supports over 20 activities in the urban, marine, and terrestrial sectors. Terrestrial sector programming seeks to improve protections for high conservation value natural areas, reduce land-based emissions through effective forest management and restoration of high carbon stock ecosystems, protect biodiversity and reduce natural resource crime to support Indonesia's long-term self-reliant growth. One of these activities is BJAC, USAID's, USAID Indonesia's national level policy project focused on reducing deforestation, conserving biodiversity, and countering wildlife trafficking. It is my pleasure to introduce Samantha Holden, BJAC's Chief of Party, and Nui Nurulialwati, Senior Research Officer in Wildlife Policy, who will present USAID BJAC's Behavior Change Communication Campaign, which is focused on songbirds. Samantha, over to you. Thanks, Andrea. And hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us for this exciting um, presentation. We've been looking forward to giving this for a long, long time. And um, I'm happy to kick it off. So thanks, Megan. Thanks, Andrea. Um, let me start with just a little bit of background about the BJAC project. Um, USAID BJAC is a five-year project designed to promote enduring changes in individual and organizational behaviors that reduce greenhouse gas emissions and conserve valuable marine and terrestrial biodiversity. To accomplish this, we work at the national level with a whole range of stakeholders to improve the management of forests and conservation areas and to strengthen protections for wildlife threatened by illegal and unsustainable trade. Indonesia is home to the second highest number of globally threatened bird species in the world. And among those, the most threatened are the pastorines, which are commonly traded here as songbirds. Songbird keeping is firmly entrenched in Indonesian culture and especially in Javan culture where bird keeping and participating in songbird competitions signifies social status. The trade in almost all songbird species is entirely legal in Indonesia. However, it is increasingly unsustainable as celebrities and popular politicians engage in the hobby and songbird singing com competitions offer high cash prizes. According to the 2015 Songbird Crisis Summit, at least 28 songbird species are extremely threatened by both legal and illegal trade in the region. In order to reduce the impact of legal trade and utilization, BJAC developed a behavior change communication strategy to engage what we call songbird consumers to shift their preferences and behaviors towards more sustainable songbird keeping practices. Next slide, please. 
So our research journey began by consulting experts on wildlife trade and behavior change from the University of Oxford Smarten School. These experts provided capacity building to our staff and helped us think through the early phases of research, as well as helped us design our demand reduction theory of change. The slide that you see here lays out the different stages of research that we carried out as the basis for developing the strategy and the campaign. First, we conducted a desk review to identify lessons learned from past behavior change and demand reduction interventions here in Indonesia, as well as around the world. And we found that several songbird-related interventions had been conducted here in this country. Um, however, they mostly focused on awareness raising and did not even attempt to measure any changes in behavior related to the campaigns. In our broader literature review, we found that the more successful demand reduction interventions shared several key points. First, they targeted very specific audiences. Second, they delivered clear, succinct messages. Third, they used persuasive approaches instead of threatening ones. And fourth, they disseminated messages through trusted key spokesmen among the target audiences. We also learned that the more successful behavior change communications campaigns were the ones that were conducted over long periods of time. For example, the Wild Aid China campaign uh, delivered consistent messaging for more than 10 years to reduce shark consumption. In addition to the lit review, we monitored online platforms that are used by songbird keepers in Indonesia, including Facebook groups, Twitter, and Instagram. We reviewed popular e-commerce platforms and online songbird news pages to study their characteristics, communications patterns, and the marketing styles that they used for songbird trading. So through this process, we were able to identify the more popular songbird species and began to understand the qualities that buyers look for in the birds that they purchase. Online media monitoring also gave us some insights on the language and communication styles, as well as specific slang and terms that are used in the songbird community, which informed the tone and the language that we used in developing content for the campaign. So after this, we wanted to gain um, more of an understanding of the possible target audience of consumers here in Indonesia. So to do this, we carried out a national short text, mess short text messaging service, that's SMS survey, that was sent to 340,000 individuals in 34 provinces to collect information on what species are most popular, how many birds consumers purchase every year, where they are purchased, and individual motivations for keeping songbirds. We received 5,579 responses, which is a response rate of about 1.7%. The SMS survey was an innovative and very cost-effective method to quickly collect the data that we needed. We could have never done this data collection so quickly and across the entire archipelago using other methods. The approximate cost per survey delivered was less than 10 cents. And this included the cost of providing data credit as an incentive for participation. And that 1.7% response rate, which sounds low, is actually higher than we had anticipated, given that the average response rate for SMS market and consumer brand surveys is about 1.5%. Um, the SMS survey results showed that the most kept species include the white rump shama, oriental magpie robin, minas, leaf birds, starlings, and white eyes. And all of these species are of global concern because of their declining populations in the wild. The results also helped us map the distribution of songbird keeping hotspots. The survey showed that songbird keeping occurs across the country and there are hot spots outside of Java, whereas previous studies had mainly focused on the island of Java as the heart of bird keeping culture. Based on the survey results, we selected the West Java region as the geographic focus of our campaign, as this is the most densely populated region with the highest number of songbird keepers and competitors in the country. At this point, we worked closely with Diogo Verissimo from the Oxford Martin School to help us develop a theory of change that identified two pathways to reduce the number of songbirds taken from the wild 
where the first path targets the supply side by looking at aspects related to poaching and hunting. And the second path targets the demand side by looking at captive breeding, bird husbandry, and social norm norms for bird keeping to reduce demand. Our campaign is entirely focused on the second pathway, which is reducing demand. Then we conducted focus group discussions with consumers and in-depth interviews, as well as initial stakeholder engagement to get a deeper sense of the nuances of local culture of songbird keeping in West Java, and to help us focus on which desired behaviors we would promote and begin to shape our campaign strategy. Next slide, please. So building on all of this formative research and our theory of change, we made some key decisions about the campaign. So working within the realities of budget and time limitations, we set a target of engaging 100,000 songbird keepers in West Java. And based on the recognition of the cultural significance of songbird keeping in Indonesia, our campaign does not aim to end songbird keeping altogether, but rather to make the practice more sustainable by shifting consumer preferences from wild caught songbirds to captive bred ones by promoting three key desired behaviors. First, ask about the source of the songbirds before buying. Second, purchase fewer songbirds. And third, keep songbirds alive for longer by performing good husbandry practices. We partnered with a local social marketing firm, Down Digital Indonesia, to create a campaign to promote these three key behaviors and work closely with them to develop the implementation strategy and to build a cohesive visual identity. So the hashtag Bijak Berkichau, which can be translated as wise tweets or smart chirps, was launched in May 2020 and has been implemented primarily through guerrilla marketing in which campaign materials and messaging are disseminated through online groups and by peer influencers. We identified the influencers by approaching the administrators of Songbird Facebook groups, YouTubers, and the heads of Songbird Keeper and Breeder Associations to explain our campaign and to ask for their support in posting messaging and materials to their pages. We chose this strategy due to the fact that online songbird groups are relatively exclusive and members tend to trust posts only by recognized active members rather than by new newcomers. Every month, Down Digital works through this network of online groups and influencers to disseminate campaign messaging through social media posts, including comics, posters, photographs, short videos, and interviews. We had originally planned to support the online campaign with some face-to-face -face meetups with Songbird Keepers. However, due to the COVID-19 pandemic, we adapted our strategy, replacing these face-to-face -face events with webinars. Next slide, please. So we began our campaign with an online baseline survey. And since then, we have used intensive social listening to monitor responses to the messaging and to track any changes in the online discourse on songbird keeping related to our campaign. As the campaign goes on, we conduct social listening for every message and material that we post, noting the comments, discussions, and reactions to them. The results from social listening are reviewed in weekly meetings to identify topics where the target audience seems to be receptive to the messaging, as well as opportunities for adaptive management. For example, in May, the messaging explaining the disadvantages of wild caught versus captive bred songbirds was well received and it caused active online discussions in the comments. From the comments posted, we could see that the audience understood the messaging that despite the low cost of wild caught songbirds, their high up upkeep costs and high mortality rates actually make them more expensive in the long run. Social listening results in June also showed us that messaging that's too direct with explicit calls to action or messaging that's too provocative caused arguments among the audience and created a negative association with our campaign. We conducted, uh, we just conducted 
an online midline survey to measure any shifts in perception and hopefully changes in behavior that my colleague Noi will tell you about in just a minute. And we are planning to conduct an inline survey to measure impact around early December. So over to you, Noi. Hello, thanks, Sam. So please allow me to continue. Next slide, please. Within only half a year, this campaign has shown some notable achievement, as well as some lesson learned for future campaign strategy. One of the important aspects is that this social media campaign is found to be cost effective. Why? Because we found an opportunity to reach a broader audience just by targeting our main intervention groups without having to reach them one by one. This campaign is targeting 100,000 songbird keepers in West Java spread in eight targeted intervention groups. By using this guerrilla strategy, it allows us to successfully reach about 71,000 songbird keeper already just in five months. We also found that our campaign is organically amplified by the audience to other 40 songbird Facebook groups outside our intervention groups, as they perceive the message resonate with theirs. We then extrapolate the data and it shows that our campaign has a potential reach up to 550,000 other songbird keepers at the same time, which is far beyond our targeted audience. We disseminate comic, video, videographic, as well as infographic to our target audience. This poster here are the examples of our campaign materials. Two posters on your top left of the screen emphasize the role of the woman in songbird keeping. The comic on the left was describing our strategy for the second desired behavior, which is to encourage the songbird keeper purchase fewer songbirds and spend their money more for their family needs. The story was reinforcing the importance of consulting the expenses for songbird hobby to dispose, so the budgeting for family needs is still secured. With the poster next to it, we reflect the third desired behavior on encouraging the audience to practice the good husbandry. We collaborate with a notable female songbird keeper in which on this poster, we highlight the importance of how good husbandry practices could success successfully enhance the quality of songbird and how this pose could help on it. We feature her life story as well as tips and tricks that she provides as a successful songbird keeper who managed to improve the good quality of her songbird by improving the husbandry. Our campaign materials also play a role in changing narratives among songbird keeper, as recorded from our target audience discussion. For example, we track an intensive discussion happening after we disseminate the poster on the right side. This poster about the cause of keeping songbird, which relate to our second desired behavior. This poster portrays the amount of expenses of songbird keeping in rupiah per year, which is equal for buying a motorcycle or three smartphones. This has successfully triggered a lasting discussion of how much they spend the money on songbird keeping. They then, they, they then calculated and shared their own expenses in the group. Moreover, they are also giving advice to each other on how to spend less even until now. Interestingly, we also found the groups that are stick with their status quo as they thought cheaper expenses are also good for them. Next slide, please. From that experience, we learned a lot that listening to our audience is the key to our campaign success and on making an impact. The three posters here are the example of adaptive management by social listening that we intensively applied to our campaign. The two comics on your left side describing the third desired behavior, which is to encourage the audience to practice the good husbandry. In the comic on your far left, we formerly used the words budak burung or bird servant as an overview of their daily life serving the bird just like a servant does. This provoked strong denials and comments disagreeing with the post, and some reactions were found to be quite extreme. We then adapt by flipping the message as can be seen in the comic next to it. 
this comics reflecting the same situation of how songbirds keeper spend much of their time for their songbirds only. We use the word saying, do you also do this? Accompanied by the list of many husbandry requirements of wild caught birds. We found the audience resonate with the message as they did not feel being pointed out as they've done uh, something wrong. From here, we learned that our target audience is much more comfortable receiving an implicit message. Therefore, we mostly use more comics or series of stories presenting in carousel formats to make the message more receptive and flowy for the audience. With the poster on your right, we found a discourse that happened during the campaign regarding the role of bird brain or familiarly recognized as bird band in other country outside Indonesia. In relation to our first desired behavior, we encourage audience to ask the source before buying the songbirds. This also leads to the larger goal to shift the consumer preference from wild caught to captive bred songbird. The captive bred songbird could be characterized by the band on its leg. However, the social listening, by social listening, we recorded that the audience perceived the band as bird accessories rather than captive bred identity. So in order to enabling the environment, we see this as an entry point to adopt our messages. We disseminate this poster that described the actual role of the bird bands as captive bred identity, and it's important of seeking the birds with the bands. This will allow them to choose the birds with the right bands carefully. Next slide, please. From the formative research, we learned that the songbird keepers tend to look up to some trusted figure on doing songbird keeping. Most of them are notable figures in songbird association, social media influencer, and songbird keeping as well, who live in West Java. And that makes them as a part of our target audience too. They create and manage their own YouTube channels. Thus, we engage with these people as our key opinion leaders, or we call it key OLs, to promote our message wider. We identified that these people have various interests ranging from songbird competition and songbird business as their contents for social media. And the one on the right corner named Bang Bowo has a good interest in songbird conservation since the beginning. During five months of engagement with these KOLs, we track of positive changes by the shift of their YouTube contents. Formerly, most of them are focusing on the economic value of songbirds when making the YouTube contents. So it's all about how to make the birds ready to compete. These mindsets are changed when they were engaged to our campaign. Within a half of a year of the campaign, they are voluntarily making the content on why we should buy captive bred songbirds and how to take care of songbirds so they will remain healthy, both of which are aligned to our key messages. There is also a specific interest such as from Kang Ebot, the second person from the left, the king of songbird competition who is willing to transform the competition uh, for the captive bred songbirds only. And of course, for the birds, uh, with the bands. They are now willing to be the ambassador and we will collaborate further with them to reach a wider audience and making impact. This has been an important achievement to this campaign as we never asked them to change their content. Instead, they were inspired from our campaign and start to see the importance of our key messages. From these changes, we could see the potential sustainability of this campaign because if it is important for them, then there is a hope that they will continue working on this issue, which will be amplified to a broader audience. Next slide, please. So within five months of campaign implementation, we monitor the progress of the campaign in relation to collective behavior of our target audience in eight intervention Facebook groups. We conducted a midline survey, which has just recently completed. So all of the data presented here is fresh from the oven. We then compare the result with the insight that we obtained from the baseline survey back in May. Um, the first line of the result is the one that related to our first desired behavior to encourage the audience to ask the source before buying. In baseline, we found that most of them are buying songbirds that is affordable to them, which the one that is cheap regardless the source of it. 
Looking through both, both baseline and midline survey results, we figured out that there is a significant increase in the number of people who consider buying captive bred than wild caught songbirds before a purchase. The number increased from 26% to almost 67%. This means captive bred is being considered as a top choice when they want to buy and keep songbird. The second line of the result is presenting the second desired behavior in which to encourage the audience to purchase fewer songbird. We measured their purchasing frequency in both baseline and midline survey. We found that the number of people who buy songbirds up to three months before the survey remained stagnant by 30% until recently. This still could be perceived as a good result since there is no increment on the purchasing frequency during the campaign. Probably the situation is also affected by the pandemic too. Meanwhile, the third line of the results describe our third desired behavior to encourage the audience practicing the good, good husbandry. In the baseline, we found that most of them focus on cheap husbandry, where they only prioritize the food and not considering other variables such as wider cage, supplement, let alone fed consultation. Here we figure out that after five months of the campaign, the number of people who practice good husbandry show an increase from almost 9% to 27%. This was recorded from the audience who improved their husbandry practices by prioritizing having a wider cage after the food for their songbirds, besides supplement and making appointment with the fat. All of these positive changes align with the result of our bigger goal, which is to shift the consumer preference from wild, wild caught to captive bred songbirds. In the figure on your right side, we capture the positive increase on the number of people who would suggest their friends or relatives to buy captive bred, and a decreased number of people who suggest their friends to buy wild caught. So, built upon this midline survey result, we conclude that this campaign and its strategy works effectively and is on the right track to make an impact. We will use this data further to adapt by exploring and co-creating the message, especially for second, second desired behavior, which is to encourage audience to purchase fewer songbirds. We will do this with our QLs in a way to make it more effective and resulting positive impact. Over to you, Sim. Thank you, Noe. Um, so just to conclude our presentation, um, I want to talk a little bit about the focus of our campaign. Because so far, our activities have focused on the individual songbird keeper, uh, next on their family and peer networks, and then also at the community level, working through the groups and the associations that they belong to. This last slide here shows us how we would move forward with steps to engage structural factors, such as government policies and regulations to support our demand reduction campaign if we had more time. So an example of this would be to work with the Ministry of Environment and Forestry to strengthen the captive breeding program, to eliminate opportunities for wild bird laundering and to increase consumer knowledge of and confidence in the system. So with that, I will conclude our presentation. Thanks again for this opportunity to share some work that we're really proud of, and we hope that you enjoyed it. And I guess we're ready for questions. Thank you so much, Sam, Samantha, and also Nui for this wonderful presentation. Um, I do see some questions coming in the chat box, and I think we're gonna take a look at Hadlet. Um, hopefully that will work for everybody. I, I do, <clears throat> did want to share that I sometimes have to paste the link into a new browser tab to get that to function. Um, also, and give it a little bit of time to load. Um, but so far, these are the questions that we see coming in. I did want to ask right before we get started, though, there was a question on <clears throat> what was the methodology for your midline? And I'm assuming that that was also the SMS text messages, but um, just wanted to give you a chance to talk a little bit more about your data collection methodologies. Okay, I'll take a first stab at that, Noe, and then you can complete if there's anything else. So the SMS survey was for the formative research. That was the first time that we mm -hmm. 
at Songbird Keeping across the country. And then when we began the campaign, we actually did an online survey. Um, and we used the same methodology for both the baseline and for the midline. And we're gonna use it again for the end line as well. Mm -hmm. And how did you find those respondents? Was it through the SMS texting or were they a whole new group of people? Um, no, for, yeah. oh, go ahead, Tim, sorry. No, go right ahead. Yeah, for the uh, SMS survey, uh, we collaborate with the telecom cell, the telecommunication provider. And uh, for the midline, baseline and midline survey, um, we we obtain this uh, respondent that is uh, that is uh, participating or joining these uh, intervention groups, which is uh, as we mentioned, we have eight intervention uh, Facebook groups that we selected at the at the beginning of the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, I'm giving a chance for some upvoting of the questions in Padlet. If um, our participants wanted to take a look at those and help me pick the questions to ask. Um, and also, um, I wanted to talk a little bit more about your guerrilla marketing strategy, because uh, I know that there's, you know, you have such an active presence online and you're reaching a really awesome amount of people. Um, but maybe talk a little bit more about kind of your adaptive management and social listening processes. When you do guerrilla marketing, you're, you're, you're reaching the right people, but you lose a lot of um, control of some of the, the messaging. So just the pros and cons of that, and, and how did that work for you? Okay. So for guerrilla strategy, actually, um, we engage with two parties in disseminating the campaign messages. So we have these guerrilla agents to disseminate the campaign materials in Facebook groups. And we also collaborate with, uh, with this group, Facebook group admins or member that we trust. And the second one, we, we collaborate with this uh, KOL, the key opinion leaders that we mentioned in the presentation to disseminate the campaign materials to the KOL circle like their Facebook fan page or YouTube channel, and these are respective people in the Songbird Keeping communities. So we have this selective uh, process of choosing the guerrilla agents, and we identify who has, uh, who is the person who shows similar point of view with our messages. So uh, those person that we select to, to help our campaign further. And for uh, engaging with the KOLs, we also do initial approach in the uh, formative research. Uh, so we engage uh, formally with them and we introduce them that uh, we, will, we, we have the strategy to, to have a campaign further. And they, they, and they have these uh, thoughts and inputs uh, uh, we can we can say that it is a, a co-creation process between this uh, KOL and also our team to 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 make this uh, guerrilla strategy happens uh, for the campaign. Mm -hmm. um, to add to that, back when we were doing the formative research, after we had done the SMS survey, we started to get an idea of you know where the songbird keepers were and what sorts of channels they were using to communicate. We had a series of focus group discussions and in-depth interviews to probe more deeply into who are the most influential Facebook groups and which are the YouTubers that people go to when they want to find out more about songbird keeping. So in that way, we were able to have like a first engagement with, um, you know, with these leaders in the songbird community. And we were very upfront about, you know, the goals of the campaign and what we wanted to do and really relied on their trust and their willingness to help us transmit the messages. Um, yeah, and it's worked out really well. Great, thank, thanks for that. We have um, a lot of votes around, um, you know, one of the behaviors that you were trying to promote was, you know, buying wild caught birds and, and looking for the, the bands or, or the rings. Um, I, don't you, or have you run into any cases where there were counterfeit bands or is that uh, common in the trade? Yeah. 
Uh, so for the for that question, so yeah, we we encourage people to look for the bird with the bands, and um, okay, and uh, how to ensure that this this uh, birds is actually came from the captive bred. Mm -hmm. If I'm not mistaken, the question's right. <laughs> yes, that's the right question. Yeah, that's so. the right. That's right. Yeah. So uh, uh, usually, the captive bred birds are, are directly sold uh, by the breeders uh, to the consumers, and rare, really a rare occasion for the captive bred songbirds to be sold in the market. In cases we find captive bred songbird in bird market, it is usually as a pre-order from the consumer, and and the trader only act as a broker bridging the breeders with the buyer. Hence, we recommend the audience to choose well-established captive breeding uh, and to double check the breeders. Uh, is, we, can, uh, we suggest the, the consumer to, to see whether the breeder uh, has the certificate that ensure the pedigree of the birds. So that's, uh, that's uh, to introduce the consumer to the characteristic of the uh, captive bred birds. Mm -hmm. And for the, maybe there's this uh, species laundering issue for a uh, wild caught mm -hmm. songbird, which are claimed as captive bred by putting the pen on them. So, however, we also try addressing this issue on our campaign by informing the audience those characteristics and also moreover the, the physical condition of wild caught songbirds that differ uh, from the captive bred one because uh, as the wild caught poach from the forest, there is uh, a sum of damage uh, in in their feather and maybe in their bodies and also in their throats that could be identified as as uh, as this bird is a wild caught. But of course, uh, all of this uh, endeavor still leave a gap in preventing species laundering and. Uh, we recommend this BCC campaign should be implemented in parallel with this uh, law enforcement and also the, the advocacy, advocacy for uh, songbird regulations in the future. Um, that's great. Um, you know, there's a couple questions related to this and, and you did start to touch on them, but um, have you had any kind of sense about whether the messaging that you're doing in Java might be impacting songbird trade on other islands? Okay, so for that, I think it is a uh, potential since uh, we collaborate with this uh, so largest songbird association. So we have like around five songbird association, the largest one, which they have the members across Indonesia. So um for for uh as we know that from the formative research uh, we found that java as the as the dense province with the highest highest number of the the songbird keepers such as uh when we mentioned west java is is the, the top the the highest uh the the hotspot the top hotspot with the highest number of songbird keeper and we we could we, we can get a sense that uh, probably the demand is, uh, is came from all of this province in West Java and by targeting uh, this the end of the trade chain which is the consumer uh, we can we can uh, shift the the that uh, market trend uh, from wild caught to to uh, captive bred wine mm -hmm. and also we have this uh, chance by uh, amplification of our messages uh, from those uh, songbird associations that we engage during the campaign since they have the member across Indonesia so uh, we, we could see that our message not just uh, circulated in the West Java but also to uh, to uh, other places in Indonesia as well so we hope that uh, we're not just uh, yeah uh, our our main target is, is West Java, but we hope that this amplification could help reach other consumer in other uh, provinces, such as the one, the province that nearby the sources, such as maybe mm -hmm. in Sumatra or Kalimantan, uh, that maybe uh, could help them to choose uh, the right songbirds uh, to buy or to keep the captive mm -hmm. red one. Mm -hmm. so maybe, no, uh, I, I think that 
Yeah, no, that that's great. And I think it's connected uh, right to other kind of songbird monitoring programs. Um, how are you making that link? Just um, kind of measuring the, the, the threat to songbirds overall. Um, do you have any connections with programs for that within Wildlife Conservation Society's work? Just on species monitoring or um, kind of what's the impact on wild birds overall? Okay, sorry, it's unmute. Sorry. Um, so for the, the bird monitoring uh, program, actually uh, we are now in the step uh, to, to develop a network uh, with other institutions uh, such as uh, universities and also uh, uh, NGOs and communities uh, across Java, Sumatra, and Kalimantan uh, to, to um, have a standard in uh, monitor the, the, the birds in the, in the, in the wild. Mm -hmm. And so that's also uh, one of the programs uh, under PJOC that is linked to this one. But uh, formerly, uh, at the beginning of the campaign, uh, however, we did, we did not measure uh, what is the actual condition um, of the songbird population uh, before the campaign. So, hope, yeah, I think this still leaves a gap, but hopefully uh, this can be complemented by uh, other friends or maybe institution that, that work intensively in monitor uh, these birds in the in the wild so maybe we can collaborate mm -hmm. further in you know like uh, uh, collaborate in the um, analyzing the data and mm -hmm. maybe seeing no, no doubt that's impact. beyond the that's beyond the immediate scope um, of this campaign for sure but there there's other yeah. other work going out there monitoring songbirds and just um, wanted to to make those connections as well um, you know, kind of a several questions in our Padlet are talking about kind of the unintended consequences perhaps of the campaign. And I think you gave us one example of your adaptive management in messaging where one of your messages, um, you know, you really reframed it quite quickly uh, because it was promoting a negative response. Um, have you had any pushback from traders or how have you dealt with that? Those, those people that, that you are, you're trying to change them, right? And change yeah. their behaviors, which is not always accepted positively by everyone, right? So kind of how have you dealt with that? Especially in the political context, you know, you didn't mention how popular um, bird keeping and, and competition is even at the highest levels of Indonesia's government, right? So you have potential to really shake things up. So I'm just wondering how, th how that was going for you. Okay, maybe Sim? Yeah, so um, yes, that's a very good question. We haven't seen pushback from the industry. Um, we've seen a great deal of support from government because we involved them in the early stages of the campaign when we first did a soft launch to announce, you know, the goals of the campaign. And we were very purposeful about uh, choosing the goal of the campaign, not to end songbird keeping altogether because that would be a non-starter from the beginning. Um, but to shift the way that people do it so that the songbird keeping that happens is more sustainable. And we've managed to deliver a lot of pretty sophisticated information and messaging through a very uh, acceptable way. Like these cartoons, these comics that we've been putting online, people relate to them, they like them, they feature Indonesians, you know, who they recognize. And, um, and we've had great response. And the social listening has churned up a few um, sort of, I don't know, heated debates about the way people do songbird keeping, whether it's good or bad. And a couple of conservation people who are more conservation minded have questioned us saying, look, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be promoting songbird keeping at all. You know, and why are you doing this if you say that you're concerned about conservation? But we always go back to our core message, which is, you know, if people are going to do it, then let's be sure that they can do it better. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, the, that spurring of the debate and that communication and the, the interpersonal communication that you're that you're doing is exactly what you want in in social marketing messages, right? Because it, that then you know people are thinking about your message and talking about it, and it's just that fine line between uh, positive impact and and going negative. And I think by doing the social listening and adapting your messages as you're going, I think you're just you're doing a great job of of keeping those messaging frameworks going forward. Um, you know, we did have a couple questions on the Padlet about um, some of your audiences and your influencers, and you mentioned one um, key audience, which was women in your campaign. I thought maybe you could take a moment to talk about um, and give us some more of the kind of anecdote and rich information around how have women responded and, and that role, particularly around the household income, right? I think that that could be tr tricky to uh, kind of what happened with, with, with that, with those responses. I can okay. start with readings and know you can join in if you um, yeah, have to finish. Sure. But when we did the in initial survey to see who is doing the songbird keeping, we found that women don't participate in the sport in, in the hobby in high numbers. So for that reason, we were targeting more the, the male songbird keepers. And then we worked with our gender specialists to review the materials and look for opportunities where we could um, promote gender diversity, I mean, gender inclusion and open a space for conversation between household members about the hobby and hopefully bring the influence of more than one person in the household about decision-making to spend money on this hobby versus you know, other things like food or other household expenses. Um, at the same time, we also found some really terrific accomplished um, songbird keeper champions who were women, who were very well known in the, in the field and who are great spokespeople for our campaign. So we've had, the one that was in the presentation is uh, a well-known songbird competitor. Uh, she's a key opinion leader. She has great advice for songbird keepers and she connects directly with the female part of the audience and we've had great response. Um, to the messaging that she's given. Noi, anything else? No, you cover all great. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. Great. That's a great, a great example of hitting your target audience by, by other people who are important to them. And I, I imagine there were also some, uh, some great discussions around the household uh, income related to how much you spend on your birds. Um, you don't. Know, I really wanted kind of as our last question and please anybody, um, if you have your question you're dying for me to ask, um, I'm happy to do so if you would drop those in the chat box. But I really wanted to give you some time as we wrap up here uh, to talk about like what's next, you know, when, when will you do the end line? Um, you know, I, I saw that your, you know, your 30%, 30% behaviors, you know, was pretty consistent and I think that's to be expected in only five or six months of implementation. but. Kind of what's the plan for your end line um, survey? And then afterwards, what, what comes next in your campaign? Wow, yeah, I can't believe that the campaign is going to come to an end soon. Um, it will continue to run through the end of November and we will do our end line survey in the first couple of weeks of December and have our results from there. Um, and we're really excited to see what we can achieve in these last couple of months, especially now that we've identified that maybe we can change our messaging or try a different tack when it comes to that second key message, that key behavior that we wanna promote. Um, so there's that. Um, we've identified tons of ideas for opportunities to improve the captive bread system after you know, after BJAC ends, anybody who's working on this, actually anybody who, in the sector who's interested in working on this could, could take those recommendations forward. Um, one of the issues that, um, that we're starting to deal with is the sustainability of our messaging, because this is a guerrilla marketing campaign. It's, you know, we produce the materials, but they were distributed through key opinion leaders and um, all of our guerrilla agents. And we want a way for that information to continue and for the conversations that all of these materials have sparked to continue. 
So as part of that effort, we've started a Facebook fan page where we are posting all the materials from the campaign and where songbird keepers can refer to the information and also continue to have a dialogue about the different issues that the campaign has raised. In addition, like Nui said, we've seen tremendous uptake from our key opinion leaders. And we think that that is a very uh, hopeful indication that they will be moving forward with the messaging that we've been promoting even after the campaign and BJAC have ended. Great, I'm giving the chat box um, one more time for any last questions. I, you know, we have put our learning group resources uh, in the chat box for you. We will send around the link to this presentation. And right now, I would really love, love it if our participants could just use the chat box to give you a huge round of applause on all of your work um, and any other comments they'd like to share with you. Um, please, let's, um, let's fill up that chat box with your comments and questions and virtual applause. Um, you know, I, there's so much content in here to really absorb. I, I think a lot of our participants are just really thinking about, you know, what does good demand reduction campaigns look like? I think you've provided us a really great example. And you've also provided us an example of a very cost effective. Um, I know Indonesians are totally connected to their SMS text messaging. And, you know, to be able to do that um, for the low cost that you have and have that kind of rich um, feedback from consumers to feed into your campaign and, and then also they're just your guerrilla marketing strategy um, also um, very effective to, to spread and disseminate uh, your messages I would did um, Andrea Jason anybody else from team Indonesia um, would you like to offer any final words I think you can come off mute and do so sure so this is Andrea um, I want to say you know that that one of the things that I thought was was most interesting in the way that this campaign unfolded is that guerrilla aspect to it and and how you know it, it's possible to have your the message that you want to share and have it be picked up by key opinion leaders and and that that has been such a, a useful way to access the target audience um, and then I just want to you know again commend um, USAID BJEX team for all the work that they did in, in carefully monitoring how those messages were being received and, and making adjustments as necessary um, to, to make sure that um, you know, we, were, we had the best chance of the, of the desired impacts that we wanted to see, which I think from the results of the, of the midline survey, we're, we're starting to see those positive changes. And um, it's really been um, you know, a pleasure to, to watch as this whole campaign unfolds. And um, I'm just really happy with, with the results that we have at this point. Thank you, Andrea. Um, Jason, anybody else, Team Indonesia? Anybody else with BJAC, WCS? Nuri, Samantha, would you like to say any final words? Hi everyone, this is Jason Duke. Um, just wanted to say thank you so much to BJAC uh, for this great presentation, more importantly for their work over the years to uh, really uh, make some meaningful change and, and, uh, and use it based on uh, you know, these, these great new approaches here. Um, thanks so much for the audience as well and the great questions and, uh, and to you, Megan, um, for hosting. No, my, my pleasure. Um, we did post a link to a two question feedback form. If you would like to please fill that out. Also give us any um, guidance of content that you would find helpful. Um, it's really been great to see the, the high number of participation in this webinar and also just the, the community that we really are building around demand reduction and changing wildlife consumer demand. Um, I know Jan and Nora and all, all of our, our team uh, behavior change specialists um, are doing tons of great work and it's it's a pleasure to share that and learn from it as part of this community. Um, we have uh, recently extended our wildlife traps program which will really have a strong focus on continuing to support this community of practice um, writ large and also you know really pay the attention that we need to do on wild meat consumption and 
pandemics, uh, zoonosis that we're all living through. And I know that COVID has really changed a lot of your in-person engagement strategy and you, you've really made up with that through your guerrilla marketing and online engagement. So just thanks everybody. Um, wonderful presentation. We will share that and uh, and keep, keep this going. I'm really eager to um, Coming up in November, December, we're still finding a date. Our next webinar, I hope, will be with Wildlife Asia and the team working on uh, reducing uh, the use of tiger products in Southeast Asia. So stay tuned for that coming soon. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Megan.